If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. And uh, what an incredible passage we're going to dive in and let the text do the work today. But I was told that uh, you guys have been kind of finishing up a family series, a, a parenting series, and, and uh, um, was even alluded, hey, maybe you could talk about that. But I've got to tell you, guys, I've got four kids. Their names are any, many, many, and it because there ain't going to be no mo. I tell you, all right? Uh, I've got them from six eight, 10, and 13. And listen to me, I've, I've done all the education I can do. I've been to the conferences. I've, I've, I've been to breakout sessions and training sessions and church sessions. And, and of all of the things that I have learned, the one thing no one has ever taught me is how to wake up a 13-year-old and still be sanctified the rest of the day, all right? Because I'm just telling you, it is a new stage of life for me. I don't know. I'm like, where did this kid come from? Who is he? They must have mixed him up at the hospital because I'm telling you, I don't know this kid. So I say that to say to you today, I, I don't really, I'm not the person to probably talk about parenting. I'm working my way through that with my wife right now as we try to just survive and be parents that God has called us to be. However, However, what we talk about today together is applicable to that of parenting and family. And if there's ever an area in my life, my friends, that I need what we're going to talk about today, it is in how to be a shepherd to my family. I want to talk to you today about living a grace-filled life. Living a grace-filled life. Grace is an interesting thing, isn't it? Grace is always there, but rarely do we take advantage of it. Grace is always offered, but rarely is it on our lips or is it deep in our heart. Oh, maybe when we sing the words amazing grace or amazing grace, my chains are gone. It, it floods our mind in those moments. But the truth of the matter is grace is an ever present aspect of the goodness of God in our life. For many of us today, before we even get started, there's things going on in your life that that you just need to be reminded of the grace of God that is there for you, whether it is in a circumstance you're facing or whether it is perhaps you don't know Christ, you're exploring Christianity, you're exploring this God thing, and you need to understand the grace of God and the goodness of God through his grace. And maybe today you need to be like my son. My oldest son is 13, and he's, he's about this tall. And uh, my 10-year-old son is, is, is red, fire engine redhead, and he's about this tall. And so I keep telling my 13-year-old, I would not mess with him because it's not going to be long. He's going to be bigger than you. And all of these times that you've messed with him in life that I've had to stop you, I'm going to one day not stop him. And one day he's going to be bigger than you and he's going to pin you down and you're going to start screaming for daddy. And daddy's going to say, I'm going to pull up a chair and watch. It's going to be awesome. But my, my, my 10 year old, he's redhead, fire engine red hair. I, he looks like Opie on steroids, man. He's just a big kid. And before we moved here, uh, we, uh, we used to live right by Six Flags over Texas. And so I used to get our family uh, um, uh, season passes and we would go there after work sometimes or whatever. And we would just go and just run in the park and ride the roller coasters. And I, we, it was great because my wife and I could take them for a couple hours. They would be exhausted. They would go home and go to bed and we could actually look at each other and go, how's your day? And we were, we were, we had been going for two or three years and my, my redhead son, my 10 year old, who was just massive, I just watched and every year he would fall just a little short of what it required to ride the Titan. Has anybody ever ridden the Titan at Six Flags? All right, if you have not, it is the mecca of roller coasters. I mean, it goes way up and you just kind of freeze there for a moment and pretty much everybody wants off at that moment and you can't get off. Well, we had, we had been going for years and he could not ride this particular roller coaster because he wasn't tall enough. Well, finally, this was during the holiday of the park. It was very cold. It was nighttime. And, and, and we walked in, and I looked at him, and I said, son, guess what? Tonight's the night. You're finally tall enough to ride this roller coaster. And he looked at me with his big fire engine red head and his big old eyes. He said, dad, I'm not riding that roller coaster. <laughs> I was like, what are you kidding me, man? I've been waiting for years. Oh, you're going to ride it. He said, dad, I am not riding that No matter what you say, I'm not riding that roller coaster. I said, Carter, you don't understand. You're missing the big picture here, son, at, at, you know, eight years old. You're missing the big picture. This is like a passage from boyhood to manhood for you to ride this with your dad. I mean, this is, this is what it's all about. And he looked at me and said, dad, I am not riding that roller coaster. 
So I did what only any good dad would do. I said, buddy, I'll give you five bucks. He said, where's the line? And so we went and five, five bucks for, for an eight-year-old is a lot of money. And so we went and we got in the line and he was watching. He was so scared. We finally sit in the seat and we bring the seat down and lock in place. And I thought, I got you, sucker. <laughs> And we go around, and when you, when you go around, you begin to climb, and that climb seems like an eternity. And it was freezing cold, you know, like 50 degrees. <laughs> Nighttime, as we were going up, you could see the whole city of Arlington. You could see where the Dallas Cowboys uh, show up. You can see where uh, the Texas Rangers play ball. And it was just a gorgeous scene. And I looked over at him, and I said, Carter, Dad forgot to tell you something. He said, what's that, Dad? I said, you know the only way to ride a roller coaster, right? He said, no. You know what it is? You put your hands up. He looked at me. He said, have you lost your mind? <laughs> he said, Dad, I'm not doing that. As we got near the top, I just reached over, and I took hold of his, where he holds on, and I grabbed tight. He grabbed my arms, and I mean white-knuckled. <laughs> he grabbed it on as hard as he can, and off we went down the fall. And as we were falling, screaming, I looked over, and my little redhead boy had his eyes closed, <laughs> screaming at the top of his lungs with his hands raised. But you know what? It wasn't until he knew that dad had his back that he was willing to let go and enjoy the ride we were on. It wasn't until he knew that dad was there and that dad had his back. It wasn't until he knew that dad had it all under control that then and only then was he willing to let go and raise his hands and enjoy the ride he's on. Might I submit to you this morning, as we look at the topic of grace in your life, maybe for the first time or maybe for the first time in a long time, you are reminded today that God is with you and that the father has your back and that he holds it all in his hand and that he has it under control. And maybe just for the first time today or the first time in a long time, maybe you would be willing to let go and press into the grace of God, knowing that the Father has it under control. And maybe today you would raise your hands for the first time or the first time in a long time and simply enjoy the ride God has placed you on. Because my friends, grace is there for you in that realm. Titus, the book of Titus, Paul writes this incredible book. It's a book we don't read a lot. It's a book we don't preach from a lot. It's a doctrinal book. It's, a, it's very rich. And I just want to let the text speak for itself this morning. And we'll move quickly through it. So uh, if you'll just follow along. Beginning in verse 11 of chapter 2. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives when in the present age. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Now, here's what I love about verse 11 through 14 in the book of Titus chapter 2. It is a single sentence in the Greek. Perhaps one of the greatest theological statements in all of the Bible, so much so that Paul did not want to break it up. He says all that we just read in one single sentence. Now, when we think about grace, we have to have a common understanding. Here's a few definitions of grace. Thayer says, it's merciful kindness by which God, exerting his holy influence upon our souls, turns us to Christ, keeps, strengthens, and increases us in our faith, knowledge, and affection, and, ki and kindles us to exercise Christian virtues. Now, for those of you like me in school, that's way too long of a definition to memorize. Let's summarize it this way. Someone has once said, grace is God's own unmerited favor through Christ. Unmerited. We can't, we can't work our way up to the grace of God. Grace is, I love this definition, grace is everything for nothing for those who don't deserve anything. Think about that in your life. Grace is everything in our life and it costs us nothing for those of us who really don't deserve anything. 
today for the sake of us being on the same understanding, could we have this common view about what God's grace is? That grace is more about what God desires for us than what God demands from us. Because our life, we, are, we live our lives trying to prove ourselves. Every one of us, we try to prove ourselves. Even today, I will call my dad, and when good things go, I try to call him, and, and I just want to hear my dad say, good job. Or when things, when I really mess up and blow it, and I call my dad, I'm wanting him to say some kind of positive way of how he could affirm me, even in that, because we had spent our entire life trying to prove ourselves to everyone else. And this is what the Word of God says about grace, that grace is not about what we can do for God. It's about what God's already done for us us. You see, to sum up grace, we need to see it's not about what we can do. It's about what God has already done through Jesus. But grace is important in our lives, my friends, because grace is what, is what differentiates Christianity from any other religion. Their path to salvation is always based upon merit that they've earned. It's always based upon what they can do, but yet Christianity is not about what we can do. Christianity is what's about already, that, that's already been done for us. And I want us to look in here and see four aspects of grace that Paul gives us today very quickly in Titus chapter 2. The first thing we see is found in verse 11. Listen to this. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. The first thing we understand is that there is an assurance of grace in our life, that there is an assurance of the grace of God ever flowing in our life. Look what it says, for the grace of God has appeared. Now we're going to see two appearances here in this passage. This one is that the grace of God has appeared. The second one is that the, uh, that the glory of God will appear. So the first grace that we see or the first appearance that we see is the grace of God for us. The second appearance that we see is going to be the presence of God, the appearance of God, the glory of God coming for us. And so we understand what he says, for the grace of God has appeared. Now, the Greek word for appear is epiphino. It's where we get the English word epiphany. It's like a light bulb moment. It's to bring light upon. It gives this picture for us of, of, of it being pitch dark, middle of the night, pitch dark, and all of a sudden it's time for the sun to come forth on the horizon. Have you ever been awake early enough to watch the sunrise? You get out there, you put your chair out or your blanket out and it's pitch dark and you look at the stars and you marvel at the stars, but in a moment, and it's almost as an instance out of nowhere, the sun begins to shine, the sun begins to show its, its glow and all of a sudden, every bit of that darkness is now gone because of the illumination of the sun. Thus is the word picture of what Paul is saying, for the grace of God has appeared. It is as if our life was pitch dark. It is as if our life was, was, was beyond seeing the hand in front of your face. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the grace of God appeared on the scene as the sun does on the horizon. And as the grace of God appeared in our life, the darkness had to flee because light and darkness cannot coexist. And so Paul says, here is this picture. Your life was a mess. Your life was hopeless. Your life was helpless. And by God's grace and in God's timing, the grace of God appeared on the, on the horizon of my life and it pushed out the darkness because of the goodness of his grace. You know what he said? For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation. You see, grace is manifested through Christ's sacrifice. Understand something about grace. Grace is not Mount Sinai where the law was handed down. No, instead, grace is Mount Calvary where the Lamb of God was slain. You see, grace is not a list of rules to be kept. Grace is the fact that Jesus came and gave his life for us. Grace is not extended through universalism, but instead the exclusivity of Christ. Look what he says. For grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people. Paul is not saying that all people will be saved. Paul is not saying that there's this universalist approach that you can live life the way you want and you never have to admit there's a God, you never have to embrace Jesus, and you can just be saved. That is not what Paul is saying when he's saying all people. Paul is saying there is an exclusivity of Christ through the grace of God that differentiates the, the, the salvation in Jesus versus the other world religions. I've heard it said, and I think it's true, all roads lead to God, but not all roads lead to heaven. 
Oh, my friends, every road's going to lead according to Scripture. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. All roads will lead to God, the judgment seat of God. Every person will bow their knee in their heart to God. Every person will at some point admit that Jesus was king. So all roads lead to God. But my friends, there's only one road that leads to heaven. And it's found in the grace of God through the salvation that Jesus brings. There's an assurance in our life, man. If you're exploring Christianity today, just know that you can know that you're saved. You can know that your sins are forgiven. You can know that everything you've ever done can be forgiven, cast as far as the east is from the west by the assurance of the grace of our God through his son, Jesus. We see there's an assurance of grace. The second thing we see is what is the activity of grace in our life? See, grace not only has appeared, but grace is ever present in our life. It's, it's, it's in a continuous, ongoing presence. And what is that activity? What does grace look like in your life and in my life practically? I can assure you, and I'm just going to be honest with you, I can assure you that by the time the sun sets today, I'm going to need grace in my parenting. I can assure you. So what does grace do in my life? How is it active? How does it impact my life in my day-to-day walk with Christ? How does grace appear in my life? What does it look like? Well, I'm glad you asked. Look at verse 12. It appeared on the scene in verse 11, bringing salvation to all people. But verse 12 shows us what it continues to do in our life. Look what he says. Training us to renounce ungodliness, worldly passions, And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. When? Tomorrow? No. Yesterday? No. In the present age. You see, what we understand, what does grace look like? Grace looks like it is a continuous teaching agent in our life. In fact, in, in what Paul says, the word training is paduo. It means to educate, to discipline, to teach. And it says that it's teaching us, it's training us. What is it teaching us to do? Look at the text. To renounce ungodliness, a lack of holiness in our life, those things that continuously creep in our life that make us uh, walk away from the things of God, that pull us away from our lives showing the glory of God. It is a, a sinful thing in our life that holds us back in grace comes in and it teaches us to renounce that in our life, to simply say, I am no longer going to struggle with that because I am bought by the blood of the lamb. I've been bought with a price and the Holy Spirit is leading me in my life. I'm going to position my life to to push away from that because grace in my life allows me to renounce that in my life. You see, it says it renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. You know, I like to tell people, man, I got saved and I never got over it. But honestly, there are days where I just blow it. Anybody else have that experience? How many of you already blew it this morning? No, don't tell me that, all right? (laughs) Anytime I have to get on I-25, I pretty much mess it up. (laughs) But you know what grace does in our life? Not only does it help us identify those things in our life, that are ungodly, that are a lack of holiness, that are pushing us away from the things of God instead of drawing us in and pressing into the things of God. But grace not only teaches us to renounce ungodliness, but to also renounce the things of the world. We are born with a consumer-driven heart in our society. We want it to be about us. We want it to be about who we are. We want it to be about our gain. And yet grace says, no, it's not about you. In fact, it's never been about you. See, grace, understand this about grace. Grace doesn't mark an absence of ungodly desires in our life. Grace just gives us the power to deny them. In my life, every single day, there are things of the flesh. Every day before my feet hit the floor, there is already spiritual warfare going on in my heart and in my mind about where I will live by the power and the leadership of the Holy Spirit, or I will lead by the power and the leadership of the flesh. And every day there is this ongoing battle in my life that says, hey, Nathan, you ought to gratify yourself. Nathan, you ought to have instant gratification. Nathan, it ought to be about you. Nathan, don't you deserve this? Don't you? And listen to me. You might remember, some of that might sound familiar. Remember when Jesus tempted, uh, was tempted by Satan himself? Every day of your life, Satan and his, enemy, and, and his demons, and they are continuously out to get you to live your life in the flesh, but yet the Holy Spirit says, no, because of the grace of God, you have the power to deny that sin. 
It does not mean there is an absence of desire in your life to do ungodly things. There just means that there is a presence of the power to deny it. And if you're here and you don't know Christ today, I want you to understand just because you come to embrace Jesus as your Lord and Savior does not mean life is going to automatically get better. In fact, I would probably challenge that and say, if you don't know Christ today, you're on the enemy's team. You cross that line of faith and you become a follower of Jesus. Now he's worried about you. See, just because you come to faith in Christ doesn't mean all of a sudden you're living in Mayberry mentally. It doesn't mean that everything's great. It doesn't mean that everything goes away. It doesn't mean that that desire that you struggled with before you crossed that line of faith goes away automatically. It just means that you can look that desire in the face and you can simply say, I want to do this, but I've been washed by the blood of the lamb. I've been changed. And now I look at this and I say, I have the power not to do this because I'm going to be led by the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. And oh, dear friends, can I just be honest with you? I'm afraid that we have churches filled today with people who give in to that desire day by day and they don't look at it and say, I have the power to deny it. When I was a pastor, man, I was constantly in counseling sessions with people saying they have all these things going on in life and it always generally came down to some kind of root problem of some sin in their life that they just would not look at it with the, through the lens of grace and power of the Holy Spirit. And I would just simply want to say at the end of this, like just, you know, the answer is just stop sinning. <laughs> like look at it and understand the grace of God gives you the power to deny it. I want you to understand secondly, that grace is not a license to sin. It's just the opposite. It a, it's a, grace is a force that drives you from sin, doesn't give you an excuse to sin. Man, I talked to all kinds of people when I was a pastor and even as as traveling and speaking and people say, well, you know, here's the thing. God's grace is here today and it'll be here tomorrow. Therefore, I can live like I want to today because God's grace waits at the door for me tomorrow. Oh, my friends, you have a faulty view of the grace of God. Grace is not a license to sin. What scripture teaches is that what grace does, it doesn't draw you to sin and give you an excuse to sin. Grace pushes you away from sin. It teaches you to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-right, self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age. So we understand that there's an assurance of God's grace in our life that it appeared on the horizon of our heart to expose the darkness in our life and to wipe it away by the sacrifice of Jesus for salvation unto men. And there's an activity of grace in our life that it's constantly working on us. When I was a kid, my mom went to be with Jesus in 2015 and she was about five foot tall. She was 59 years of age when she went to be with the Lord. It was unexpected. Just went to sleep and never woke up. When I was a kid, we were at the grocery store. I still remember it as if it was yesterday. I was probably about five years old. And whatever I did embarrassed my mom in the grocery store. Now, I I, I don't remember being bad, but I I just remember her looking at me. And I remember her, she didn't even have to get on a knee because she was so short. Uh, But I remember her just kind of looking over and she pointed her little bony finger and those little beady eyes in my face. And she looked at me and she said these words, you wait till I get you home. (laughs) Anybody have a parent like that? Oh, man, yeah, my, my, my parents believed in spanking. I still got the paddle they used to spank me with. And just because she was five foot tall, don't let her stature be equated for weakness. She looked at me, she said, you wait till I get, you have embarrassed me. You wait till I get you home. I knew what that meant. I'd been there before. We went to the car and. She gets in a car. I thought it was interesting, even as a kid, that she gets her, you know, she she can't even barely reach the pedals, but yet she gets in the car and she's up front just talking to herself. You ever made your parents so mad they just start talking to themselves? She's up there just going, you just, I just can't believe this. She's not even saying anything, but I knew she was talking to herself and I knew I was in trouble. All of a sudden from the front seat as she was talking to herself and fuming, she heard me in the back seat start singing, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Remember that? Took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. I know how patient he must be because he's still working on me. You want to know what grace activity in my life is? By the way, I didn't get a spanking. That's probably why I remember that song. (laughs) But do you want to know why 
I remember that song. And you want to know why I love grace as I do? Because what grace does is no matter how bad I've blown it, grace says he's still working on me. No matter what I've done, no matter how far I've gotten from God, no matter how big I think the sin is in my life, no matter what I've done, no matter what the gap I think is between God and I, I love how patient he must be because by God's grace, he's still working on me. Can I just tell you today, he's still working on you too. So we understand there's an assurance of grace. We understand that grace has an activity in our life. But thirdly, look what it says in verse 14. 13, I'm sorry. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. So the first appearance we see was the grace of God appearing onto the scene as a sun comes onto the horizon. The second grace, the second appearing that we are, are, are looking at in the text is the appearing of the glory of God through Christ Jesus. That is when Jesus comes back. That is the second coming of Christ. And grace not only is an assurance that we know that the grace of God is there, it's not only an activity in our life that, that we know that he is still working working on us day in and day out, and we are able to renounce ungodliness. We're able to renounce the things that push us away from him. But grace, there is an anticipation that grace brings in my life. What is that? Because of the grace of God and because of the salvation that grace brings, and I cross the line of faith embracing Jesus, there is going to be an appearing of our Lord Jesus. We will see him again, my friends. And no one knows the time, the hour, the minute, or the second, but what we know is that there is a promise that at one point the clouds will split and our Lord Jesus, the one who gave himself for us, the one who gives us the opportunity for grace, will leave once again the presence of the Father and he will return here for those who know him. It is an anticipation in our heart that the grace of God brings because his grace uh, allows us to be saved, because his grace allows us to walk with him, there is an anticipation that his grace also gives to us that one day our Lord and our Savior, the one that we say his great name, he will bust out of those clouds and he will come back for us according to scripture. Because of God's grace in Christ's death, we have the opportunity then in grace to live with an eternal perspective. Now, I'm not a crier, man. I'm not a, I, 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 I'm, a I'm kind of an emotional wall when it comes to that kind of stuff. I will say this, the older I get, the more maybe my eyes water a little bit. But there's one thing that you can do to me that will make me cry every single time. You know what it is? You put on a YouTube video of those soldiers coming home after being gone for a while. You ever seen those? Little girl's in her class and dad walks in and she drops everything and she runs and she just grabs him and she just says, daddy, you're home. Or the, the dad is, shows up in the middle of the football field with a helmet on right before a big Friday night game and, and that big old son he's got that's a, a, an athlete and a tough kid, he pulls his helmet off at the middle of the field and that tough kid leaves and that kid drops to his knees and guess what? The football game doesn't matter anymore. Why? Because daddy is home. Or that dad that is a catcher behind the plate and his daughter throws that first pitch and he takes that off and you think she cares if she threw a strike or not. She throws down that glove and she runs and with anticipation, she grabs a hold to her daddy or her mom and there is a reunion there that just somehow gets to me and I look at those and I think these are incredible but they hold nothing in comparison to when my Lord, the one who gave his life for me, will bust out of the clouds and I will drop everything that's of any significance and look to him, my Lord, and I will say, Daddy's home. That, my friends, is what grace brings to the table in our lives. We are able to look at our lives not with a temporal focus, but with an eternal focus simply because of the grace of God. Because of God's grace, Jesus will come again. And there's a fourth thing we see today and will be done. Look at verse 14. Who gave himself for us take that word us and just put your name in there who gave himself 
to re- for us, for Nathan to redeem. Nathan, put your name there, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. What does the scripture say? That not only is there an assurance of grace in my life that it bursts forth on the scene of my life, but there's an activity that grace is constantly working on me. It's making me what I ought to be. It gives me the opportunity to run from sin, not run to sin. And there's this anticipation that grace brings that one day, the very one who gave his life for me, the very one that I'm living for will come again and there will be an incredible reunion. But there's a fourth thing we see, and that is what is the accomplishment that grace has on our life? I love what Paul says. For the grace of God, for listen to me, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for us, for a people himself. First thing we see is that he gave himself. If you're here today, man, and you're checking this thing out, understand that Jesus gave his life for you. And I believe with everything I've got that if you were the only person that ever lived beyond Jesus, he would have given his life just for you, that you may be reconciled to the Father. He gave himself for us to what? To redeem us. To redeem us, to to purchase our sin, to carry the sin of our lives on the weight of his shoulders. He gave us, he redeemed from us for all lawlessness. Why? To purify. The Greek word is katharizo. It's where we get our English word catheter. What is that? I'm not going to go in detail. But let's just say this. They give you a catheter to purge you from impurities that are in your body. Think about this, that he gave himself, he redeemed us, why? To purify us, to get those things that are in our life out that aren't aren't good for us, that aren't good for his glory, to purge us of impurities in our life so that when we stand before him, we are a holy and blameless people. I love, look at verse uh, chapter three, verse four. I love what Paul goes on to say. But when the goodness and loving kindness of our God, our Savior, appeared, he what? Saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, listen to this, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his what? Say it again, church, by his what? Grace. We might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. My friends, the accomplishment of grace on our life is that Jesus gave it all so that we may have it all. Jesus gave it all that we may be heirs according to the hope of the eternal life. Let's summarize what Paul says about grace. One theologian says it this way. I think he summarizes best. Chapter 2, verse 11, we're talking about the past. Grace has appeared. It is justification, saved us from the penalty of sin. Verse 12 is the present. It constantly trains us. It's the present tense, trains us. It's sanctification. It saves us from the power of sin. So grace appeared in the past, justifying us, saving us from the penalty of sin. That is eternal damnation, separation from God. But in the present, it trains us. It's sanctifying us. It saves us from the power of sin. In verse 13, it's looking to the future. It's the glorification. And that is, it saves us from the presence of sin. When Christ returns, we will no longer be in the presence of sin. We'll be in the presence of the Father where there is no sin. Oh, my friends, grace is not just an amazing word we sing a song about. Grace truly is amazing. I heard the story about a young fam, about a family, and they were raising a teenage boy. A teenage boy went through a tough period and Began to get very angry and very violent, and one day he struck his mother in an argument. The dad came to this boy and he said, Son, I love you so much, and my heart is grieved at what you're going through. I love you so much, but I can't let you stay here because you've been violent with your mother. 
So, son, you're going to have to go. This, this, this boy was around 18, and you're going to have to go. You're going you're gonna to be on your own now. I can't let you be here when you're violent. So the boy got angry and got mad and he got his stuff and he walked out the door and said, I'll never see you again. He slammed the door. He went off and he began to live his life and he got into all things, went down a road he did not need to go on and began to just waste his life away, pursuing the worldly passions. One night he found himself homeless and hungry and cold and he was just wandering the streets in a Midwestern city and he looked up and somewhere way down the road, he saw on this dirt road, this, this light. And he thought, man, maybe that's someone's porch. And maybe I can just go knock on the door and ask him for something warm to drink and maybe something to eat. And so he began to wake his way through that light. When he got up to that light, it wasn't someone's front porch. It was what we would have called years ago, an old fashioned tent revival. Remember those when they would put a tent up, you'd meet for like 47 days. <laughs> And he thought, you know, at least it's warm under there with that hay underneath that tent. And so he went in, he sat down on the back row, and he began to hear a guy talk about Jesus and how Jesus can forgive you no matter what you've done. That you can never be too far to be out of the grasp of the love of God. At the end of that service, that old boy got up and he walked down that aisle, that center aisle, and he went to that preacher and he said, I've ruined my life and I need to know that Jesus can forgive me. And right then, right there, right down that night, he bowed his heart and his knee to the Lord Jesus, and he declared Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And he knew he had to get it right at home, so he wrote his old mom and dad a letter, and he said, Now, Mom and Dad, I know that you've not heard from me, and I know that I said I hated you, and I didn't want to ever see you again, but something has changed in my life. Mom and dad, I gave my life to Jesus, and today I'm walking as a new man, and I just want to ask it in your heart if you can forgive me, and I want to come home. He said, Mom and dad, here's the deal. We live next to the railroad tracks. And he said, on this day, I'm going to buy a ticket home, and that old train will go right past our backyard, and here's what I'm asking. If you can find in your heart to forgive me and to trust that I'm a new man, would you just take one small ribbon, white ribbon, and would you tie it on the one limb of that old apple tree in our backyard? And as I pass on the train, if that ribbon is there, I'll know that you found it in your heart to forgive me. Mom and dad, I'll get off at that train station and I'll come running home. If not, I'll just keep going and you'll never hear from me again. Well, the day came and the young man boarded the train and he was as nervous as he could be. His hands were shaking and he was ill to his stomach knowing or not knowing the certainty of what would come. And as he began to ride that train and as they would get closer and closer to his house, he would become more physically shaking and emotional and tears were just streaming down his hand and as God, as his, down his face. And as God would have it, there was this old man sitting across from him and he said, son, I don't know what's going on with you, but I'm a retired old preacher, and I just want to know, is there anything I can pray for you about? And this young man looks at him, and tears just streaming down his face. He tells the entire story, and he said, preacher, in just a few moments, we're going to go around that curve, and I'm going to know whether my mom and dad can forgive me or not. And preacher, my stomach is hurting. I can't feel like I can't breathe. I can't bear to look. Preacher, would you look for me? That uh, young man put his hands in his face and he began to sob uncontrollably as that train went around that corner of that track. And as they went around the corner of the track, the old preacher looked out the window and the young man began to hear the preacher sniff. The young man said, preacher, they don't forgive me, do they? I've done too much wrong. I've, I've hurt them too bad. I, 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 they'll, they'll never forgive me, will they? And the preacher said, oh, no, son. That's not it at all. He said, son, when we rounded that corner, standing out by that apple tree is an old white-haired woman and a white-haired man with a big bed sheet that they're waving, saying, welcome home, son. And every limb of that apple tree has a ribbon blowing on it in the wind. Son, I think that you are welcome home. 
Here's what I'd say to you today about the grace of God. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, God's tree of grace is in full blossom today. For you who don't know Christ, today is the day in which grace appears on the horizon of your life saying, come home. God welcomes you with open arms. For you today, who there's things in your life that aren't of God, and you would say, can God forgive me? God's saying, my tree is, I don't just have a ribbon on one tree. My tree is in full blossom saying, here is the grace of God. It has appeared for you in this moment. And today, may you let go like my son and know that God's got it under control. And you, my friends, enjoy the ride that God has you on. Let's pray together. Every head bowed and every eye closed. We won't tarry this long this morning, but if you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, you've been just exploring Christianity, know this. Jesus died for you, just for you. If you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, in just a moment, there's going to be some pastors up front. Would you just stand up and come out of your seat, walk down to one of these men and just simply say, I want to give my life to Christ. I need the grace of God in my life. Jesus died courageously so that you could live boldly for him. And if that's you this morning, they'll show you in Scripture how do you enter a relationship with Christ? How do you cross that line of faith and let the grace of God have its way in your life? If you're here today, maybe there's things going on in your life, in your family, in your parenting, in your church, whatever it is, and maybe today you would say, I need the grace of God to once again work in my life. These altars will be open. They're just carpet and wood. There's nothing significant. But in all throughout Scripture, you see that the altar is symbolically where God met with his people. Would you open your heart and allow the grace of God to work freely in your life? Father, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that in these next moment or two that you would give people the boldness to press into the Holy Spirit this morning, to press into you the things of you, God, as they allow grace to once again be awakened and and alive in their life. God, I pray that people around this room, and I know there will be people around this room who do not know you, they're just checking this thing out. I pray today you would speak very clearly to them, even in this moment, that they know that I'm praying for them. And that, God, you would bring them to yourself. You'd draw them to yourself in this moment. That the Holy Spirit, you would give them boldness and courage to stand up and say, I'm tired of living life the way I'm living. I want to surrender my life to Jesus that they would experience that grace. God, I pray for all of those around here who've got a wayward son, a wayward daughter. They would be the first to this altar, crying out that your grace would flow freely in their family and in their life. Maybe it's a husband and wife, and today they fought all the way here. They're on the fence about what they're going to do with their marriage, that God, they would come into this altar and they would join hands and hearts, and that God, they would pray that your grace would be the center of their problems today. Whatever you're doing, God, in this place, this is not a man moment. This is a moment for you to pour out your spirit on your people. And I pray it so in the name of Jesus. Let's stand together.